Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is nigh to the head of the Let's turn into our Bibles to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 8. We're in the plagues of judgment. In fact, we are on, in plague number three. Plague number three. It determines by what plague it is, by what version of the Bible you're reading. Most of the Bible, the earlier versions, will say that it is the plague of lice, which is a pretty bad plague. And then there are those of you who have maybe newer versions, and it says you have a plague of gnats. He said, now wait a minute, preacher, there's a difference between lice and gnats. How could they be so different? Well, folks, the Hebrew word for this plague is a very unusual word, and there are a lot of people who have questions on the interpretation of what rather insect parasite was used in this plague against the Egyptians. The earlier versions and the earlier uh, rabbis uh, basically used the term lice. And so did Josephus, and I believe that's where uh, the interpreters of the King James Version basically got it from. And so therefore we see that matter. But probably it doesn't matter whether it was gnats or lice. I used to think, man, it, it can't be gnats, it has to be something bad, it's got to be lice. And then I went to southern Georgia for a, uh, a conference, and between the house where I was staying and the church was just across the parking lot, I was inundated with gnats in my ears, in my nose, in my eyes. It makes me itch just thinking about it. They were terrible. They were ruthless. You couldn't say three words without taking in something you didn't want to. And what the worst part of it was, was that these gnats and these lice were all considered non-kosher. That's where you see Jesus saying to the Pharisees, you strain you know, a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Well, what they used to do is they would take their wine or their drink that they had on their table. I don't know if you remember, my grandmother used to have a table in her kitchen that after you got done with dinner, they didn't put it away. It's a wonder we all didn't get botulism. They didn't put it away, but they kept the food on the table and just put a cloth over top of it. You know, and as a kid, that was like heaven. You know, Grandma's house was wonderful. If you just wanted a snack, you just went through the kitchen and lifted it up and reached in, grabbed what you wanted, you know. But in the Egyptian time, there was no refrigerator, and so a lot of their food and stuff was out there on the, on the table. And in the time of Jesus, what they would do is many times, because they didn't want to take in something that was unkosher. You know, it was meat, folks, <laughs> but it was unkosher. And so they would literally put a cloth over their uh, a glass, and then they would pour their drink just in case something would come into their glass. And so these gnats were unkosher, or these lice were unkosher parasites. And on top of that, the Egyptians were very particular about their hygiene. That's why you see a lot of pictures of the ancient Egyptians with shaved heads. There were lice galore. There were lice everywhere, gnats and flies and fleas. Oh, my. They were everywhere all over the place, still are. <laughs> but the bottom line is simple. They shaved their heads, they bathed continually so that they would stay away. So they were really particular about that. That's why this plague was terrible against these Egyptians. Again, they, they bathed frequently. I'd like to read you just a simple paragraph of a gentleman back in the 1800s who traveled in that area. Listen to this. He said, shut the tent door and put the candle outside or we shall be overwhelmed by a deluge of gnats. This is one of the plagues of this filthy city. Once when encamped on this very spot, they came in in such incredible swarms as literally to cover up and extinguish the candle. 
In five minutes, their dead carcasses accumulated on the top so as to put it out. It seemed to me at that time that Tiberius might be rendered absolutely uninhabitable by this uh, insignificant, almost invisible enemy. Has it never occurred to you that the writers of the Bible were very indifferent to those sources of annoyance when travelers now dwell upon with such vehement and pathetic lamentation? Gnats, for example, are only mentioned once and then not as an annoyance, but to introduce and give point to a severe rebuke upon pharisaical scrup uh, scrupulosity. You blind guides which stay, uh, strain at or out a gnat and swallow a camel. And certainly no comparison could be better to express the absurdity and the hypocrisy of their conduct. These gnats, when they would come in swarms, they literally would come in and cover things. Imagine in your house, your candles being extinguished by these vermin, by these pestilence. If they were lice, they were biting on you all the time, trying to suck your blood. They crawled like a swarm on the ground, whereas the gnats would fly in swarms. I remember years ago when I was in Jacksonville, we made a call downtown. And it was a huge old building. It has been since torn down. It was an old hotel back in the 1800s, I believe, or 1900s, excuse me. And we went in there and we went upstairs and, and it was just this one light bulb down the whole hallway. And I couldn't see the floor, but I swear it was moving. The carpet was moving. I said, is, is, is it me or is that floor moving? And my partner says, they're cockroaches. <laughs> I don't know if any of you saw that Indiana Jones movie. Man, they were everywhere. Can you imagine the filth that these things brought in, the diseases that are associated with them? This is a, not just a pestilence. This is an absolute absurdity for life. Try talking outside when the gnats are flying around you. Or try going to bed at night with, your, with the windows open their cracks there so they can crawl through, whatever. Also, this plague was sent to challenge the Egyptians' belief in Seth, the god of disorder, or the god of deserts, the god of storms and war. God touched literally the dust of the ground and formed out of it these vermin, these, this pestilence upon Egypt. This god was the brother of Osiris, one of the major gods of Egypt. And God was saying to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians, I am greater than all the gods of Egypt. And let me say this to you folks, God today is speaking to America that he is greater than all the gods of this world. That he is greater than all that we can produce in the matter of our gods the gods of secularism, the god of entertainment, the god of convenience. We have sacrificed millions of babies to these gods. Oh, we don't bow down and worship them, do we? Well, I don't know. Turn on your TV today and watch some of these people in these football games. The bottom line is, folks, God is in control. I want you to look first in our study, before we get into our scripture text, Something I want to cover the entire gamut of all the, the plagues. I noted in this study as I was going through a very phenomenal distinction about these plagues. First of all, there was a curious comparison between these plagues of Egypt and the judgments that were coming upon the world in Revelation, the book of Revelation. God is going to come to this world once more, folks. <clears throat> and he's going to visit this world and show this world that he is God. There will be plagues once more, like in Egypt. We'll see here in just a moment. There will be the finger of God touching the lives of men and women who we see every day. I call this generation that you and I live in, the generation that Jesus said will not pass away till all these things are fulfilled, the tribulation generation. 
And it is this tribulation generation that's going to see the very things we are talking about in our study of the plagues. First of all, the plague number one. We found in Exodus chapter 9, in verses 19, 21, it was God turning the water into blood. Keep your ribbon or your finger here in Exodus and go quickly to Revelation chapter 16. In chapter 16, we see the third bold judgment. Now, there were many judgments in the book of Revelation. Some of them were the seven seals, the seven trumpets, but the latter ones, the, sea, the, the judgments of the bowls were absolutely unbelievable. But in Revelation chapter 16, and starting with verse 4, we see the Bible saying here, Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. We see here that just like in Egypt, the water was turned to blood. That's why a lot of believers believe, a lot of Bible students believe, that this, this, uh, uh, the two messengers or the two witnesses that come in the early part of the tribulation are Enoch, or excuse me, Elijah, and Moses because of all of these plagues. Could be, could, who knows? We see the scriptural comparison here. But the significant conclusion is simple. God judges those who harm his people. God says, I will curse him who curses you. God said in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, I will bless those who bless you. Notice the plural. I will bless those who bless you. Notice the singular. And I will curse him who curses you? God takes it very personal when you mess with his people. When you mess with the Jewish people, God takes it extremely personal. And when you mess with his church, his bride, his son takes it very personal too. So we see here a very interesting comparison. Keep here in Revelation. We see the Egyptian plague number two. We saw that last week, the frogs. <laughs> the frogs. We see the scriptural comparison. Look at Revelation chapter 16 and look at verse 13 and 14. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle that great day of God Almighty. We see the sixth bowl judgment. The significant conclusion of this is simple. God judges disobedience. God judges disobedience. Next we see plague number six. <clears throat> now plague number six was the in Exodus chapter 9, and it is the plague of the sores or boils. We'll see that in a few weeks. But that spiritual con uh, uh, comparison, scriptural comparison, is in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 16 of Revelation. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore, singular, came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. One of the gentlemen who made the chip that, that some people believe is going to be used by the Antichrist to control the world says there is a small, minute battery in each one. And that he believes that that battery will rupture by God's will, choice, and uh, that will cause a great sore, a single sore, to be on each and every person who has the beast's mark. We see this... Egyptian plague has become a plague of the revelation. And the Bible says that God judges idolatry. He says in Genesis, or excuse me, Exodus 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods but me. They choose to have the gods of war, the gods of this world. They choose to worship Satan rather than the Creator. And God says, I'm going to mark you with an, an, a mark of Cain, this mark of the sword. So we see here, number six. Number seven was the Egyptian plague of hail. 
The scriptural comparison is in Revelation chapter 16. Look at verse 17. And then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven with, from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as mighty and great earthquake, as had not occurred since the men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierceness of his wrath. Look at verse 21. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. The Egyptian plague 8 was the plague of locusts. The scriptural comparison is in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 3. This is an unbelievable scripture. It talks about a demonic army. Revelation chapter 9 and verse 3. <clears throat> then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. These were demonic entities that came out as a great army that come upon the earth to attack the earth, much like a picture of the locusts in the time of the Egyptian plague. What does that mean? What's the conclusion? God judges obstinate disobedience. We see next, the last plague that was used in Revelation was plague number nine, which is that of darkness. Back in chapter 16 of Revelation, we see in verse 10 and 11, this darkness. And then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. Imagine a darkness so dark that it causes pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains, and their sores, and did not repent of their deeds. We see God judges unrepentance. God's judgments are true, and God's judgments are righteous. Just as God judged Pharaoh and the Egyptians in the land of Egypt, we see that one day God is going to judge this world. And these nations that go against him in the latter days, in the time of the tribulation, we see that these great plagues that come upon Egypt are a picture, a foretelling of something is yet to come. That you and I are seeing people every day walking about their daily lives and getting ready to be thrust into this Egyptian type atmosphere. They're going to experience things, beloved, that these Egyptians experienced. It is absolutely overwhelming. Let's look quickly at this plague of divinity. In Exodus chapter 8, starting with verse 16, we see this plague of lice or gnats. We know through God's word that he sent these plagues on Egypt to show them who he was and who the children of Israel were. God had promised Abraham his hand of judgment of those who mistreated them. And God had promised Abraham that though the children of Israel would go down into Egypt, he would draw them out. So we see here in verse 16 and 17 the realization of the plague. The plague is coming. We see in verse 16. The Bible says, So the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the land, so that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, I don't believe that every speck of dust became lice or became a gnat. I believe that this is a very symbolic language, talking about how there was so many lice and so many gnats that it was very much like the dust of the land. I believe it's a very symbolic language talking about swarms, unbelievable swarms, swarms like they'd never seen before. We see the Lord's plan of judgment, though it may not look like it, God is in control. And he wanted the Egyptians to know that he was in control, that he controlled their, their gods that they believed in. 
that he was superior to all the gods created by men. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8, the Bible says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Folks, God's ways are totally different than this world's ways. We are seeing a culture in crisis today. What had began as a beautiful, beautiful country, what began as a great experiment of freedom and liberty and justice underneath a Judeo-Christian culture has become a place of anger, resentment, bitterness, perversion, Folks, God is letting this country have what they want. And as it was once said, whatever we once were, we are no longer. And my question for that gentleman is simple. How's that working out for you? We see here the competence, or excuse me, the compliance of obedience. God's plague of judgment has come. Who is like you, O Lord, Exodus says, among the gods who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. There is no one like God. But in verse 17, we see their compliance. The Bible says, and they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth and it became lice on men and beasts. Folks, it's going to be nothing for the angels of judgment to come upon this world when God sends forth the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments upon this world. It's going to be nothing for them to stretch out their hand or take a rod and touch the earth and it become the plague of God. We see the full extent of the plague. You see, God's word is sure. God's word is true in verse 17. And they struck the dust of the earth and it became lice on men and beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. We see the full execution of the plague. It was absolutely quick, powerful, and overwhelming to the people of Egypt. And that's what's going to happen in this world today. The Bible talks about great wars and rumors of wars. The Bible talks about death and war and pestilence and famine coming upon this world. Judgment is coming, folks. And when God's judgment is, comes, it is full to its extent. When God chooses to judge in His power and His might, God does not withhold His judgment. We see here not only the full execution, but look in verse 17, the full extent of the plague. The Bible says all of Egypt felt the judgment of God. Not one Egyptian home, not one Egyptian official, not one Egyptian citizen did not have a house full of gnats or lice. I was reading one of the other versions of the Bible. The Amplified Bible even said that perhaps it could be mosquitoes. Anything pestilence like that. There are some people believe that it couldn't be gnats or flies because it came out, or uh, uh, gnats or mosquitoes, because it came out of the dust. They come out of the water. That the, the lice would come out of the dust. But folks, I don't care if it's lice, gnats, or mosquitoes. Man, what a mess that was. I swear the mosquitoes this year had red crosses on their backs. I'd go back in our little neck of the woods and sit back there for five minutes and slap myself silly. And then my wife said, did you put on your off? <laughs> Boing. No, I didn't. Folks, they didn't have off then. For some reason, I draw them. I don't know what it is. It must, that must be they, they think that I'm a great blood donor. It must be my high blood pressure. They, they stick one in and boom, they fill up right away, you know. But it was a horrible extent of the plague. What did it do? It went throughout all the land. 
Tourism was down that year, by the way. You want to go to Egypt this year? We can go see the pyramids. No, thank you. We see in verse 18 and 19 the reaction of paganism. You would think people would say, boy, this God is real. We need to back off here. We need to take a look at this. But look at verse 18. We see the deficiency of the magicians. This is the first time the magician's going to fail. Look at verse 18. Now the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. They could not. So there were lice on men or man and beast. We see the failure of their godless challenge. In the past, with the frogs, they made more frogs. Duh, that doesn't make sense, does it? You know, Pharaoh probably told the magicians, get rid of these things for me, will you? And all those frogs around, the magician says, we'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. And they did their little encha uh, enchantments and all their sorceries and looked at all their books and looked at all their little charts and everything and said their words. And lo and behold, there were more frogs. <laughs> Boy, that doesn't make sense, does it? You don't think God doesn't have a sense of humor? The blood was the same. But this time, God said, it's over. I'm not going to let you do it. And we see their failure was there. What? 2 Timothy 3, 8 and 9 says, Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all as their also was. God says no more. There comes a time in the life of people who reject, who resist God, who, who are disobedient to God, who tell God that they're not going to follow him, who tell God there are no other gods but themselves, that there is going to be no more, not a step further, not an act more, not another trick up the sleeve. The rabbit is not in the hat. God says enough. And when God comes to a point in a person's life when he says it is enough, that life is changed. We see their failure. Look at the fulfillment of God's condemnation in verse 18 but they could not, so there were lice on man and beast. Every Egyptian person, every Egyptian animal, little fluffy, their little poodles had fleas and, and they had lice and they had gnats all over them. We see in verse 19 the disdain of the monarch. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. I read one Jewish rabbi who said this, if that was just the finger, think what his hand could do. You know, there's a lot of talk in the Bible about the finger of God. We see the writing of the, of the uh, handwriting on the wall in Daniel. Even Jesus talked about the finger of God. There's something about God's finger as he reaches out and touches the lives of men and women. Folks, you have in your lap a document written by the finger of God. It is God's word to you. It is infallible. It is without error. It speaks of prophecies without any error. There's not been one disproving fact in the Bible. There's not one thing that Voltaire could do to get rid of Christianity. Why? Because the Bible is true. It's still here, folks. We see in verse 19 this disdain of the monarch. Pharaoh's adverse response. Pharaoh's heart was hardened by his own sinful choice. Pharaoh saw what the Egyptian magician saw. Pharaoh saw what 
His people were suffering with. Why? Because he was suffering from it. Sit down to have a bowl of Cheerios and what's this swimming in my milk? Flies, lice, gnats, mosquitoes. Again, I don't care what they are. Folks, it was misery. Pharaoh's heart was hardened because of his sinful choice and his sinful action. Why? A hardened heart is a result of disbelief. Do you know you choose to believe or not to believe? Do you know that you have in your reality your choices of freedom, of free will, to choose to believe or not to believe? God has given each and every one of us today that free will choice. Satan doesn't give that to you. Satan does not give you a free will choice, but God does. And God gave Pharaoh the free will choice to decide in this manner at this time what he was going to do for himself and sadly for the people of Egypt. That's why the Bible tells us to pray for our leaders. That's why the Bible tells us we ought to pray for our governor, our mayor, our president, our, our senators, our house of representatives, our judges. We ought to pray for them. And don't pray these ugly, nasty prayers of God get them, but pray that God would touch their hearts and they give them freedom to make a choice. Because you see, your belief determines your goals. That child steals that cookie because that's his goal to have the cookie. Even though you told that child they could not have that cookie, it was their desire, it was their belief, I can have that cookie. And in its elementary form, we see the child going to the cookie jar, taking the cookie when told not to, and lo and behold, what they have done is simple. They have made a choice, their goal, by their belief system. I have the right to have what I want to have, and they choose to take it. That belief gives them their goals, which produces their action. If you want to change the action of your child, change their belief system. Change their belief system, and there lies the answer. You see, Pharaoh said in his belief system, I am God. And God says, I'm going to change your belief system. Free will choice. We see Pharaoh's adverse response, and then we see his adamant rejection. Pharaoh continued to harden his heart. Again, a hardened heart is caused by disbelief and sin. The choice of of sin hardens the heart. Mercy doesn't harden the heart. God's love and mercy and grace doesn't harden the heart. It melts the heart. It makes the heart pliable and subtle so that the mercy and grace of God can be placed in it. But disbelief and anger and resentment and bitterness and all these matters of emotions cause us to sin and disbelieve and harden our hearts. Psalm 25, 12 says, Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. If you fear the Lord, you will choose to walk the way of the Lord. Jesus said it simply, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. You see, Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? I know not the Lord. If you have a personal relationship with God, you can know him. And if you know him, you can follow him. And if you follow him, he will bless your life, even in the midst of trouble and sorrow. The plague of divinity was simple. It was an attack on their gods and their religious system. 
It was attack upon the priests and all their enchantment in their magical arts and their attachment to satanic power. God was sharing with that Pharaoh as he shares with the Pharaohs today that he is God and there are none like him. Folks, judgment is coming. The Bible has said so. The question is, where do you want to be? In Egypt or in Goshen? I'd rather be in Goshen because if you're in Goshen, you're in the right place. <laughs> the bottom line is simple, beloved. Either you're in the family of God or you're not. Judgment is coming to those outside the family. Let's pray. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it, your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Let's